Well, hello and welcome to episode 120 of Photo Kitchen. I'm your humble host, MD Welch. And on this all digital episode today, we're talking about tethering tips for Adobe Lightroom Classic. I got through it on the first take without doing a tongue twister. I love it. Uh, that's always a great way to start. Now, I want to stress that this is only for Lightroom Classic. I do have a video on Capture One. I will include that in the link down below. So if you're a Capture One shooter, I got a great video on tethering tips for you there. Also, if you're looking for tethering tips as far as hardware, troubleshooting, shooting, those types of things and setup, I'm going to record one or have recorded one, depending on when you're watching this video. And I will include the link once it's available, probably already is in the description below as well. So I'm kind of segmenting or separating all of this content out because it is a lot and there is a lot to cover, but this is only Lightroom Classic and let's get right into it. So first of all, before we could even get into the actual tethering aspect of everything, I want to stress that you need to have your camera set up and you need to make sure that your camera is compatible with Adobe Lightroom Classic. I say that as a Sony user because it's only been recently that Sony is compatible with Adobe Lightroom Classic for tethering. So do double check that. Also make sure that your camera is set up and make sure that your cable is compatible and those little things. Those will hang you up inside of Adobe Lightroom Classic. But I will say that Adobe Lightroom Classic has become a very stable platform for tethered shooting. It used to be very buggy. You used to have to restart it a lot, restart your whole computer. That doesn't seem to be the case. The only thing that I will say the Lightroom Classic uh, has working against it is that there's not as many features, which could be a great thing. But the other thing is that it can be a little bit slow compared to Capture One. It just depends on what your subject matter is, if that's a deal breaker or not. With that being said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to go to Tethered Capture from the menu bar. So File, Tethered Capture, and then you're going to go to Start Tethered Capture. You could actually do this before even plugging in your camera, by the way, if you wanted to. Now I've already done a little bit of work ahead of time before we did this recording, but I do want to stress at the very start that all of these options can be changed at any time. You're not locked into any position, but getting this window right can save you time in the long run, just saves you from going back and repeating things. But if you do make a mistake, don't worry about it. You can change any of these features later on. So let's start first with session name. This is not only going to be the name of the subfolder where the images are going to go, but you could also leverage this as a file name later on. As far as session name goes, one really nice option is segment photos by shots. If you're doing multiple subjects, if you're doing headshots or product shots or anything like this, this is a great feature because it will make additional subfolders that you could use later on. And it, this is just when you're reviewing images, it makes it so easy because you could just look at a particular segment rather than all of the images. We'll see that in a moment. Now for naming, you could do whatever you want to. I go with the default of session name sequence, which just takes the session name, which we've already done, and then applies a sequence number at the end. It doesn't mean that you can't do something very original, like a custom name that I've already created. Uh, let's come into here and do my custom name, which I can then change the custom name here and then have date and time already applied to it, whatever you want to do. But if you're in a rush, you don't know what to do, or you're still not comfortable with uh, the custom naming of Lightroom Classic, just use session and then sequence and you will get a unique name there and you can reset the start number. I will just do one there and hit the tab key to lock that into position. Next is destination, and this is just where the images are going to be stored. And it's important to stress that you want to know where these images are going to go, but you're still going to get a subfolder with a session name created with all of the images inside of that subfolder. Now, the reason why it's important to know where the destination of these images are, even though the Lightroom does allow you to be very disorganized, is that there is no copy or backup copy made for these images. This is the same in Capture One as well. So there's no uh, immediate copying or backing up of the images as you shoot. So if you are shooting a big job and you need a backup to a hard drive to hand off to somebody or you just need that redundancy, you're going to need some sort of backup software. So you need to know where the photos are going to be stored. Destination is where you're going to choose that. The information panel is all about metadata and keywords. Now I've created a metadata preset, which has my contact information, also some keywords that auto generate. I've already done that. And I would highly recommend creating a preset. And yes, I've done videos or will do videos on metadata. They're never very popular, but they will save you in the long run. And you could also do keywords specific to the shoot. I'm just gonna leave this blank for the moment, but you would fill this in as you go. And the last section is other options, which gives you the ability to disable auto advance, which is a tongue twister as well. What that means is, is as you shoot, it's not gonna show you the most recent image 
as you're shooting tethered. It's gonna show you whatever image you're currently looking at. This is probably not a great idea since both photographers and clients always wanna see the last thing that you shot, so I would leave it unchecked. Once you have inputted all of your settings, you're gonna go ahead and click the OK button. Now, if you did check segment photos by shots before you could even start to tether, it wants to know the name of the first segment. In my case, I'm shooting some uh, sugar skulls here, so I'll just call this pink skull. If I could spell this correctly, this is the reason why I never do typing in real time on my screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and have that and I'll show you how that progresses as we go. So this is going to be pink skull. I'll go ahead and click okay. Now I've purposely turned off my camera just because if something is wrong, this is what Lightroom Classic is going to give you. And sometimes it doesn't give you anything other than that. It just sits here and spins. Now in my case, it's simply because the camera is off and I'm going to lean away from the microphone really quick and turn it on. And then it will take a second for the camera to essentially boot up. And in a moment, this screen should go away. There we go. And I am looking at the tethered controls. Now, for some reason, that screen stays up, even though your camera's on. You need to make sure that your camera's set up correctly. You need to make sure that you have a good working cable that is going to support tethering. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I do have a video or will have a video, depending on when you're watching this, on the whole hardware side of tethering and troubleshooting. And you might want to check that out. With all of that being said, let's dive into the actual interface because the good news is there's not a lot to it that could also be the bad news depending on what you're looking for but it is a very simple interface it's this bar it's this vertical bar that you have here that you could actually click on you can move it around anywhere on the screen this is your controls for tethering inside of adobe lightroom classic in the upper left hand corner is the name of the camera uh, if you had multiple cameras connected i guess you could cycle through them i don't know why you would ever do that but you can since i'm shooting sony it has this cryptic code but i'm shooting an a7r mark IV. the name of the session is in the bottom left hand corner and the name of the actual segment or shot is pink skull and if you click on that you could change this and we'll come back to that in a moment there is a live button which if you click this, you will get a live view of what your camera is currently seeing. Now, this is great because it makes it easy for placing product. It makes it easy for placing models. If you have autofocus turned on, you can, of course, autofocus through here. Now, I have it set to manual focus because there is a small glitch with this. There is no way to digitally zoom in inside of this window. Capture One does give you that feature, but it doesn't always work too. It seems to be a camera model, make and manufacture a specific kind of feature set. So my solution, and this is a camera workaround for Sony, is if I throw my camera into manual mode and then hit the focus ring, it will digitally zoom in. Some cameras have this as an additional button. This usually will work and allow you to zoom in and check focus. So again, I'm gonna lean back and do that. And you can see here that now I have focus going on and I have accurate focus. I can see that it's sharp. I'll hit my shutter button once just to get it back to full screen mode. And now you could see this. Now, of course, if it was an autofocus, I could do that. But sometimes autofocus on these uh, particular uh, tethering programs doesn't work all that well. So you have to just kind of feel it out and see what works well for you. But you do have autofocus controls here. It's currently grayed out because I'm in manual focus on my camera. Moving along to the right, you have your exposure triangle, you have shutter, aperture, and ISO. You could change all of these here as long as your camera allows it to do. I currently have my aperture set to the ring, so I don't think I could change my aperture here, but I can change my shutter speed uh, up or down, making it brighter or darker, and I do get a live preview here so I could see what that exposure would look like. There's no histogram here. You could see your histogram on the back of your camera, but it doesn't appear inside of Lightroom Classic. That may or may not be a deal breaker for you, but uh, you don't get a actual display of your histogram. You do also have white balance, which you could go through all of your different white balances. These are camera specific, so you might have more or less options than I do, or they might be named different because you're shooting Canon or Nikon, but you will see the camera's white balance options, not the white balance options necessarily available inside of Lightroom Classic. This is camera specific. Now we'll come back to develop settings in just one second, but at the far right hand side are your controls. You have this large gray or silver button here. This will go ahead and fire off a shutter click from your camera. You could hit it once and it will go ahead and take a single picture. You could also have it in motor drive and hold it down and it will take multiple pictures. 
If for whatever reason you wanted to stop tethering, you could hit the X and that would close the window down. The closing the bar stops tether connection to the camera. And if you needed to get back to your settings for the actual uh, tethered settings here, you could click on the circle and I will turn off live here so you could see this in the background and it will bring this back up and you could change whatever settings that you need to. Hitting the circle again doesn't do anything. You have to click OK to come back into it and I will say OK for my session and it gets you back out of that. Now, I'll just go ahead and hit live again. You can see that I'm still focused. I'll hit the gray circle here, take a single picture. Of course, I could do this through the shutter button on my camera. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the live window down. And of course, this popped up in a few seconds. The speed at which the tethering happens will have a lot to do with your cable, your camera, the cards in the camera, the processing power of the computer. However, though, I will say that Lightroom Classic is a little bit slower than Capture One, but depending on what you shoot, it's probably not the end of the world that it's just a touch slower. Now that I've brought this in, I'm just gonna bring the bar down here so it's not as distracting. I'm gonna come over to my develop module here. I'm just gonna make a few changes. I'm just gonna maybe knock down my exposure. I overexpose my images, that's called ETTR, or exposing to the right. I have a whole video on that. I'll include that down in the comment section below as well. I'm just gonna do a little bit of saturation here. Maybe open up the shadows just a little bit. Maybe knock down the highlights a little bit more. Now this leads me to one of my favorite features inside of Lightroom Classic, and that is the develop settings. Now when you click on it, it starts off with none, and it will show you all of the presets that you currently have for develop settings inside of this program. But my favorite feature is same as previous. Now I've already moved the skull through the power of editing, and I'm just gonna go ahead and take another picture. Now I still have all of my camera settings, I'm overexposed a little bit, all of that but notice that when it brings the image in, that it's nice and saturated, that that exposure is knocked down, and all of my settings here match up to the previous image. Now, not only is this a great feature for just development settings, but it's also a great way to interact with your clients. Clients are always asking all the time, oh, is it always going to be that bright? Is, can you bump up the saturation a little bit? Those kinds of things. Now you could do it on the image, and then every subsequent image that you shoot will have those settings. And as you change, it will just carry out as you go through the shoot. Do be mindful of that because you might have to go back and reapply settings later on, but at least it will keep up with you as you go through the shoot. One other thing to point out, I am in the develop module. I'm not kicked back into the library module as I shoot. So if I hit this button, say three more times, even though that my skull is not going to change position at all, I will see those images pop up inside of the develop module, which is great. So if you have to zoom in, if you have to check focus, if you have to make any additional tweaks, you don't have to hop back and forth between modules. Through the power of editing, we're back inside the library module. I want to show you in the folders panel, if I come down here to the bottom of the screen, you'll see that I have my folder named Skulls here, and I have a subfolder called Pink Skull inside of it. I currently have eight images. Now, if all of a sudden I have a new product, and in case I do already set up, I can come into the actual bar or the tethered bar here and click on the name of the session or what they call the shot name, and I will call this Black Skull. Again, my typing is terrible. Now when I click OK, what's going to happen is it's going to switch folders on me. So now we'll immediately give you a gray screen. Don't worry, you haven't lost any of your images because if you look back at the folders panel, you will see there's a new subfolder called Black Skull. I'm just going to go ahead and take a quick picture and it will go ahead and display a new skull that I have here. Poorly composed, but it gets the job done. Now, Several things have happened here. First of all, I have two images loaded inside of here because I held down the shutter button too long, but I have two images inside of here, eight inside the pink skull for a total of 10 inside the skulls. I'm also using the exact same develop settings from the previous pink skull here, so those settings are automatically being applied. And again, that image is popping up whether I'm in library or inside of the develop module. So as you can see, Lightroom Classic has a lot of straightforward features. Does it have as many as Capture One? No. But what it has is straightforward and to the point. And if you're just getting into tethering, it's really all that you need. You could see your image by hitting the live button. You can control your exposure from here. If you have a setting on your camera that you could digitally zoom in, you could check your focus. You could keep up with your request from the client or yourself as far as having same as previous development settings carry forth. It's all here, it's straightforward, and it's relatively easy to use. Just make sure that Adobe Lightroom Classic supports your camera, 
always test out your gear before a critical shoot. Don't try to troubleshoot this in front of a client or a subject. Do what I'm doing here. Set something up on a kitchen counter and make a test. And if you do this correctly, you're really going to enjoy and like this experience. Speaking of liking this experience, I hope you've liked this video. Hit the like button. Hit subscribe to subscribe to my channel for more information. Always check out and see what additional videos that we have available to you, including additional tethering videos on both Capture One and also hardware. And until next time, I'm MD Welch wishing you all the best from Photo Kitchen.